الخير لكل مشاهدينا مساء الخير لمشاهدي واتساب ميديا نتورك برنامج هي بيسلط الضوء على نجاح المرأة العربية الأمريكية بكل المجالات ضيفتي اليوم هي ضيفة مميزة هي المحامية فدوى حمود واللي دخلت التاريخ كأول مسلمة وأول عربية أمريكية تعين لمنصب محامي الاستئناف العام بولاية ميشيغان فخليكن معنا بحوار مع فدوى حمود اللي وصلت أو هاجرت على أمريكا بعمر ال 11 سنة واللي أصبحت اليوم من صانعي القرار بولاية ميشيغان Welcome to HIA. My guest has an outstanding personality that has worked tirelessly for decades and earned her status as the Solicitor General for the State of Michigan. This status makes her the first Muslim Arab American to obtain this outstanding position. Her name is Fadwa Hamoud. She is a graduate of Wayne State University Law School and a former member of the Harvard Business Young American Leaders Program. It is a delight to have the opportunity to conduct this interview with her to know uh, what motivates her and what has inspired her over the year in a stressful and relentless environment. I'd like to welcome uh, the Solicitor General of Michigan, uh, Fadwa Hamoud, and we'll be right back. The One, we are business consultants who equip leaders to lead at their highest level while building teams that work together and support their team and the leadership. We deliver customized business solutions that fit your company's needs, including business development and customized process solutions. Contact us today. Thank you. And welcome to HIA. I'd like to welcome you to the show. Well, thank you. It's an honor being here, and it feels like home. Good, good. So I'm very I excited so to be here. I am so happy that you are here with us today to share your journey to success and to talk about your life. So you are the first Muslim and the first Arab American Solicitor General in the nation. And not only that, you're the first woman to obtain this position in Michigan's history. What does this uh, success mean to you? When, when we talk about our journey, I think that if my journey taught me anything is that there's no such thing as individual achievement. Uh, it is a collective achievement and I think that what this means to me is everybody that has invested in me. Uh, and when I say in me, it is in the Arab American Muslim woman, whether it was in education, uh, whether it's my family back home, uh, whether it was my mentors here in the community, whether it was watching, you know, women around me struggle, or whether it was having to deal with the backlash of different things that happen in our community, like 9-11 and whatnot. To me, that when we talk about the journey, I can only think of a collective achievement, that this is not in any way an individual achievement. Uh, because if this was an individual thing, then I wouldn't be in the position that we are in today. And I say we, it is because I truly look at this as a representation uh, of what makes me who I am, and that is my community as a whole. So it has been uh, an absolute honor and a responsibility that uh, I do not take lightly at all. 
That's nice. Uh, I know uh, you were appointed by uh, Attorney General Donna Nassel in 2019, which is last year. That's right. Uh, yes, and uh, what happened at that time uh, during this ceremony, this wedding and ceremony, she said that you are uniquely qualified for this role. Does this make you have like a greater responsibility toward your Arab American community? Absolutely. I think that one, um, it is because of my experiences, um, and of course, you know, when our Attorney Gen General says a comment like that, I also do not take that lightly. This is somebody who I uh, respect and quite frankly honored to work under her. Yes. She has been, you know, a pioneer for justice for all Michiganders and, um, you know, has fought for all people and all minorities, people of color, marginalized communities. Uh, so I do not take that responsibility lightly. When, when we talk about rep representation, you know, it's uh, important to say that I serve all the people of Michigan. And the people of Michigan have a beautiful, colorful community. Uh, one of those communities is the Arab American community. Yes. So just like how I fight for uh, you know, what people would say my community, absolutely every single day I fight for the people that maybe might not look at me as somebody from their community, no matter where Correct. they are in, their, in the state, True. no matter what their beliefs are, and no matter what their biases are, uh, it is my responsibility to make sure that under the law I represent them and represent the state as a whole. And it is my absolute honor to represent the citizens of the state of Michigan. And we are very proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Y you know, you argue uh, some of the most complicated cases uh, in the highest courts, and Flint water crisis is one of them. But we're going to talk about that later. But first, I wanted to share with our viewers your journey uh, to success and your upbringing. You know, you immigrated uh, at the age of 11 to the United <coughs> States from Lebanon yeah. uh, with your family. That's right. And I want to know how uh, you, you could retain or how at that time uh, you try to retain your, uh, uh, what do you call it, your identity from your uh, uh, birth country and try to fit in into your new home. You know, I think that when I think of my story, it's the story of so many mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in our nation. And it is the story of most, if you look back. Um, and that is the story of an immigrant. Um, you know, I was, uh, I, I grew up in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. I am from a beautiful village in the south called Arnoun. Mm -hmm. And uh, I still have a family there. In fact, I still visit there. I took my memories? kids there. Do you have memories? I have the best memories there. Um, you know, and I have memories of growing up um, also understanding that when we talk about justice, it wasn't something that was attainable. Mm. It was always something that, uh, you know, not only did you have to fight for, but people were getting tired of the fight. And uh, despite all of that, around me I was surrounded by people that were resilient that, you know, for years and for centuries fought for justice without a result, sure. but that was never, that never stopped them. You know, justice wasn't just a, a, a goal, uh, something that people felt they must, they must reach. Justice was something that was ingrained in our culture, in our religion. Yes. Empathy was part of justice. And that is something that I grew up with, um, you know, watching my grandmother who didn't have much, who would pray, you know, may God keep everybody safe so we may be amongst those who are. Um, so I think that, you know, my background, my roots, my values uh, are precisely why uh, I am the person that I am today. So what, what was the most memorable thing in Lebanon to you? What do you remember the most there? Um, I definitely remember, um, I have good memories, mm -hmm. and I have memories that still, um, you know, um, kind of give me pain till today. Okay. You know, my school was closed one day because 
um, of a bombing. You know, Lebanon was under occupation at the time. And I remember uh, we, you know, during the war, we sat in a malja in Beirut. And um, there was a priest there uh, along with an imam. Mm. And uh, even dis despite the fact that so many things were happening above ground, um, there was such unity in how people can comfort each other and come together. Yes. Whether the person next to you is your child or not your child, there was a sense of unity. In fact, you know, my experience at my school um, and, and the fact that they didn't have the same opportunities that I later obtained when I came to the United States, I would always feel that guilt, mm. uh, that guilt of um, how easy access to education was in the community that I lived in. Even though, I'll, I'll, a disclaimer as well, even in the United States, we see that I had a good school because I was separated by a street called Tyreman. Mm. Uh, as opposed to the schools on the other side of that street. Okay, so, so you felt it a little bit here. That's, so is that what you're saying? I think as I, as I grew older yeah. and as I went to uh, college and whatnot, you start to see that uh, what you saw back home and when we talk about access to education, I thought that that was something that was unique to a third world or to a country that uh, you know is not in the same state as as um, what as we were in right now, but I think that the older I got, uh, I was able to see that some of those practices that we thought were only in countries far away from here were happening across the streets or maybe some zip codes that are different than mine. That even though we lived in the same country, people here didn't have the same access to education so that I did. So the still exist. It exists absolutely, yes. and, and and you know, and I, and I think it's so obvious, and uh, and you don't have to look far to find that uh, mm -hmm. when we talk about equity and access to opportunities and education, that's still something that we are fighting for here in, in the United yes. States of America. Yes. So, yes. Um, yeah, but when we talk about memories, I have great one. You know, I have great memories of my grandmother's uh, hands making kishik for the oh, okay. <laughs> for for the entire. Uh, and I don't know what you would call kishik. In, kishik, in, I have in, no in, idea <laughs> in, in English, but uh, it's very good. It's a, I know it's a very good <laughs> dish, and I love, one of my favorite. <laughs> Absolutely, you know, okay. or her. So she used to make that. She used to make kishik, or okay. or the zatar, or the way she used to, you know. Um, always with the good. sesame seeds. Always over. good memories about food. Absolutely, it's anything it's about smell. food. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, who would you like to give credit to today for mentoring you uh, while growing up? <clears throat> you know, it's hard to pin down. I think we started this interview by saying that there's no such thing as an individual achievement. Of course achievement. not. Of course not. But I think that um, you know, at growing up for mentoring me. Um, I had, you know, a, a grandmother. Who, it, it's definitely you can't pin, pin down to one person. I'd, I'd be, I'd be you lying can have if I uh, could. A few mentors, right? of course. So my grandmother, with an, an elementary level education, taught her kids how to read and read poetry, oh. right? Uh, my mother, who, you know, at a time where it wasn't really, you wouldn't hear of women going away for college. My mother did and uh, taught music and worked three jobs while she made sure that we're getting our education. So I think that there are many women around me in, in many ways were extremely inspirational. Did, but you I'll spend, say, uh, did you spend a lot of time with your grandma uh, back home? Absolutely. Okay. I mean, everybody knows when, and even when I go back, you can't get me to leave Armun okay. or her side. But I think to, but, but that doesn't take away from, you know, I think, I attribute my success as well to the men in my life who were not only, not only encouraged me to, to read or to go to school, uh, but were my allies in, um, in every part of my success. And I think that I knew who I was because I constantly saw who I am in the eyes of my father, and I think that that was so important. It was, you know, in a culture where sometimes you hear different, 
you know, misconceptions about how women are treated yes. or what is expected of women or the fact that our men are raised differently than our, than our women. Uh, it was never like that in, in our home yes. and definitely not like that with my father. My father was my biggest advocate. My father made me feel more empowered because I was a woman. I never looked at being a woman as, as something that would uh, hinder my success. Mm -hmm. It was, um, you know, it was a positive. And uh, I think that in my home, I saw that how we raise our sons like we raise our daughters and vice versa. And I think uh, I attribute that uh, to my father as well and all the great men in my life growing up. Did you contribute some of your success to your father? Very much very so. Much. Very, very, very much so. And, and that's precisely why. Yes. You yes. know, if, if, if you know my father, um, He's my I would love to. I would yeah. love to meet him he's and talk amazing. to him. I hope he's, he's watching us right he's, now. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's amazing. We have a question for you, but I think I'm going to cover that as well. Uh, how can you manage to be a mom and a solicitor general? That's a great question because you know, Good especially <laughs> for for the women out there. And I, and and I and I have to say this. I have to start with the story. Yes. Um, prior to um, you know my current position. Uh, when I was six months pregnant with my daughter, Julia, I, um, you know, I was pregnant. I was talking amongst the community with some people that I plan on applying for an appointment on the school board. Yes. And uh, the reaction that I got, even from some women, were, but you're pregnant. Oh. As if it were a disability. <laughs> exactly. I'll tell you, <laughs> that made me want to do it even more. <laughs> but here I was thinking, here I am, this superhero, a body literally making another human being mm -hmm. and people are looking at me because I am a woman because I am pregnant as if it is a disability yes. or you know how could you do that being you know um, a, a mother or pregnant right uh, I tell you I take so much pride in um, one having a daughter and a son Hadi uh, and the fact that when they want to play pretend, uh, they play swearing their oath on the Quran like their mother. Mm. Uh, the fact that they ask me about my cases and that they know that their mother is representing children like those communities in Flint. So they're so involved. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. But I think I can do what I do because I have also a husband who is um, just like my father, my ally. And just like we teach my kids to respect his work and look up to him because of his successes, it's re reciprocated through their mother. Yes. And the quality time that we spend with our children, you know, is, uh, is maybe I compare it by, uh, you know, in, in a second, a thousand years. But my, I, I, never once have I felt that me being a solicitor general, and I, and I say this because I hope women are watching, is that this, this has been a sense of guilt for many women. Yes. And I'd be lying to you if I still don't hear it or don't feel it, because that's just innate yeah, in us. We're all guilty of that. It's, it's innate we in us. We can't help it. But when yes. we see our children, and when I see what my children strive, strive to do, um, you know, when we say, you know, your mother went to a program in Harvard, your, bro your father is, you know, successful defense attorney or a magistrate, that's the norm. Yes. We can show our kids what the norm is, right, instead of just telling them what it should be. Yes. And uh, I absolutely love being the Solicitor General, and that in no way, in any way, has ever made me feel less than a mother. In fact, it's part of how I raise my children. And uh, it is um, it has made me a better mother. That's awesome. That's uh, that's great. Uh, um, I have to say thank you for everybody who is ever watching right now. If you have any comments or questions for the Solicitor General Fadwa Hamoud, please uh, we'll we'll answer. We'll try to answer uh, all the questions. We have like a couple here. But what inspires you on a on a daily basis? What keeps you motivated? The fight for justice. I think what keeps me motivated are um, my children and um, uh, knowing that they are going to grow up in this world and um, fighting uh, for a world that I want my children to grow up in. Yes. When we talk about being a mother, I hope that me being the Solicitor General, it's not about being the first. 
it's making sure that I'm not the last. Mm -hmm. And it's making sure that um, the obstacles that maybe I went through are easier for Julia. Uh, or as a Muslim, they're easier for Hadi. Uh, I think my children inspire me. And I think that uh, justice uh, for all communities, uh, specifically, you know, marginalized communities, uh, communities um, that need me. I feel like I'm privileged to be in a position where, one, I, uh, I work for an attorney general who fights for people every single day, and, and I have the opportunity to, to do that to as well. To be able to do that, for sure. So that inspires me. Yes. I'm excited every single day. I think, you know, to go out today's there another help. opportunity yes. to help. And, yes. um, you know. That's, that's awesome. Uh, I want to talk about your education. Uh, you uh, finished law school. You obtained your uh, law degree from Wayne State University. And you actually completed this amazing, prestigious uh, program from Harvard uh, 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 Business School. Uh, it's a leader program, right? How, how have you benefited like from, this, uh, from this program? So when we talk about education, I, I can't start at Wayne State. So okay, I have to take it back. University of Michigan. <laughs> no, or I have to take it back to to Lori and, and Fortson. Okay. Really. We'll go back. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, I think uh, what really helped me the most as a student is the fact that I was an immigrant who uh, did not know the language when I moved here, and I was offered an opportunity in Dearborn Public Schools to. Um, as an English learner to have the resources available sure. uh, to me for me to be where I'm at today. So I think that that's extremely important. Yes. And as an immigrant, as someone who, you know, uh, didn't even know how to apply for scholarships, as someone who, whose parents couldn't afford, um, you know, to pay for a prestigious school, I got accepted into uh, great universities, but I chose to go to Henry Ford College. You started with Henry Ford. Absolutely. Okay. And it was a great opportunity. And for, you know, uh, you know our, our status, our financial status at the time, you know, the credits that I was able to earn, I think that that really is what gave me the basis for my education. Yes. And from there on on, I received a scholarship, went to U of M Dearborn, graduated another got great school. political science yes, degree political from, science the, degree. from U of M? Yes. And uh, went to Wayne State uh, Law School, where you know really you start to learn about you know the differences in education sure. and you know different communities and and the access that they have, right? Yes. But you know when we talk about the Harvard Harvard Business School Young Professionals Program, that that was not just my success alone. That is success. That is truly was a success of uh, our community and professionals in the business world recognizing you know young talent with the help of many that advocated for me uh, in this program and because of my community involvements as well uh, whether it is you know uh, civic involvement political yes. involvements my education my work my career this was also another collective achievement and when you meet with professionals at a school like Harvard um, from all over the country, uh, it is truly a humbling experience. And uh, I'll tell you, we don't have enough chairs around the table. But uh, that's why it's very important to build those bridges, make sure we are opening up those doors so people behind us have an easier time sure. entering. Yes, yes. Uh, prior to uh, being appointed as a solicitor general, you were part of the, Dur the Durmont Public School uh, uh, the board. The school uh, board uh, and school I worked board of for... The board of trustee. Yeah. Yes. How was the experience uh, like uh, as a board of trustee and at the same time uh, did it uh, help, you know, with your career, basically? So, so prior to me being Solicitor General, I was Assistant Wayne County Prosecutor for Prosecutor Kim Worthy, mm -hmm. who is one of the most inspirational women I know, who will probably watch this. And uh, I owe much of who I am as well as a fighter, a prosecutor, or somebody that represents the people to okay. her. And at that time, I also served on uh, the Board of Education for Dearborn Public Schools and Henry Ford College. Yes. And it was uh, probably, um, 
one of the most inspiring, enriching experiences that I wouldn't trade for the so world. So contributed to your success, uh, obviously. Uh, yes, and I, and I think, you know, I lear when, when we talk about my success, it was, um, it was the success of the students sometimes and the teachers and my colleagues yes. that inspired you mm. uh, that you have no other choice but to move forward. And, it, and you know, I mean, when we talk about Dearborn Public Schools, um, those, uh, when we think about the, the future that we envision for our kids um, or for Julia or Hadi, uh, when we see some of the rhetoric going around our country, if you want to invest in your country, you invest in, in, the in, in the schools and in our young people. Yes. Because those are the voters of tomorrow. Those are the politicians of those tomorrow. Are the those church. are the leaders of tomorrow, the doctors, the teachers. And, uh, you know, sometimes when we are so frustrated with what's happening in the present, we make sure that we are investing in those that we know are going to lead the future. Uh, and that inspired me. Yes, yes. Um, it, was, it was amazing. It really was. And, uh, and it was uh, an experience that was so humbling and uh, refreshing to see uh, the amazing students we have mm. and the leaders that are taking over tomorrow in the best of ways. So. That's nice. And uh, we have the question from uh, Hassani, is that right? Hassan, Hassan. Uh, what motivated you to go into law to begin with? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you got to ask Hassan. my dad that. Uh, you know, I think uh, when I was younger, it was, uh, it was you're either a doctor a doctor, a doctor, maybe a dentist, and if you don't want to be, you know, a doctor or a dentist, a lawyer. It has th to be that a lawyer, your parents right? will be okay with being an engineer, oh. right? <laughs> and that is because I Other think than the, that the legal loser. world in Lebanon, maybe, or overseas, is, 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 is different than it is, yes. uh, than it is here. But I think uh, there was something that was always innate in me to fight for others. I was never the type of person that could sit back, for example, uh, and sometimes it got me in trouble, even at home, you know. Uh, I, I like uh, speaking and being that voice for those that can't speak for themselves. And I think that that is something that I've enjoyed. Um, so you had it in you, uh, obviously. I, I, had it, I remember being younger okay. and writing poems about it. But, you know, when I first started uh, college, I, you know, was taking organic chemistry classes. I was going to be a dentist because my mom already had this clinic in her That's head. It. <laughs> and it was going to be pink, and I was going to be a dentist. And my father sat me down, and I was into my pre-med. Mm. Uh, I came home from school one day. My dad sat me down, and he said, Fufu, which is what he calls me. And he said, if what you love to do is clean tables at restaurants, then make sure that every restaurant people go to, in which you've cleaned those tables, that they can see their reflection in that table. What an if, the awesome bet, if what you love to do is collect garbage off the street, then make sure that when people are cruising down the street that you picked up the garbage, that they see flowers instead and that it's, that it's spotless. He said, what do you love to do because it's not dentistry? And it was, in a sense, my father that kind of, you know, he Shook helped me you, probably, and said, yes. you go back to your counselor, and he said, you know, he said, what, do you, what are you going to do tomorrow about what you love to do? I said, I'm going to see my counselor, and I'm changing my degree. And uh, it was the best thing I did. But then you feel good because he said that I felt, to you? I felt relief. Yes. I felt relief. You needed that. Because oftentimes, you know, we are peer pressured into norms. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, and, and we want to... This, I, I knew I was good at science. Mm. I was, you know, I was doing well. I hated it, but I was doing well. But I knew eventually deep in my heart I would go back into law. So do you, do you think, like, that was back then, but now do you feel or do you think that women or Arab American women have the freedom to choose who they become? Absolutely. Do you think it's getting better? I, absolutely. I, I think uh, you don't have to look further from the amazing women in our community who, Hanan, you have been interviewing, you know, I think on a weekly basis. Now, yes. <laughs> and uh, you have, uh, we, we have so many examples uh, of women. You just, you just have to go through we all of the so videos and, and see. amazing women And, and women in this here. community that yes. inspire me every single day, right? And it's not a matter of can we. 
right? Women can. They're strong enough. They've been strong enough uh, since day one. Yes. Uh, so absolutely, absolutely. Do we still have some cultural no norms that you know uh, are still not accepting of that? Absolutely. Yes, but some some women feel like there is like, or they find gender equality elusive. Don't you agree? Uh, I think that uh, how could you not in a world when you know? I'm sorry, and I'll say this: uh, you have you know the person sometimes leading a country degrading women. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we still live in a world where um, when we talk about gender equality, uh, yes, we know that it is possible, uh, but we know that we still have a long way to go. Even when you want to talk about pay, uh, equity in pay, if you look at you know, the research and the statistics there, we definitely still have a long way to go. So we have a long way but, to go. But when we, you know, when we ask the question, do we think that women can, uh, absolutely. I mean, our women have prospered and in they all aspects of life yes. uh, nowadays. And they have proven that. Yes. And they have proven that. So. Yes, yes. So uh, before we, oh, I have to ask you one more question before we go, uh, before we take a break. Have you ever felt marginalized? Absolutely. Okay. Tell us. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. And I think that, that that's what makes you... Um, you know, uh, love this sort of work even more in terms of uh, representing the people. And that is why it is so important when we look at different places to have people from different communities, including people from marginalized communities, in diverse workplaces because of what they can bring and add to the table. But I think that being mar marginalized is not an experience to be to me alone. I, you know, I would feel selfish talking about my own experiences. I think every single person in my community, many of the kids that went to my high school, um, Fortson and others, have been marginalized. And in a way I think or that another, media, maybe. absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, my mother has been marginalized. You probably, whether you like it or not, ha have been marginalized. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, you know. Or have I been discriminated against? I'll tell you, you know, um, but how do I, have, I, have, I have received some threatening mail as the Solicitor General. Um, and, you know, because of who I am and because of my, my identity. I uh, mean, not just as a woman, as Arab American, you know. Absolutely. I mean, even as a prosecutor, I've, I've, I've prepared for a case to represent a victim, and when the victim found out that I was Muslim, they asked for another prosecutor. I didn't give up on that victim. Okay. But I think it's an opportunity uh, that the only way we can change and break those stereotypes is to continue doing what we are doing and continue, continue prospering in a way that we do. And in fact, every single person that has said a comment to me, and believe me, there's been plenty Mm -hmm. um, I make sure that they know exactly what my heart is, uh, not necessarily through my conversation with them, but t today I represent every single one of them, and I will continue to do so. And I think that we break those stereotypes, and you know, we get our yes, of course, we're, we're a marginalized community. That's not a that's but not they, something unique to me. But the key is not to stop. But look, absolutely. But look at what we can do, right? Um, and that is, I think, something that has made me and many other men and women and children in our communities and in all marginalized communities stronger. Yes, yes. Uh, before we take a break, uh, before we continue our great conversation with you, I'd like to mention that uh, Fadwa Hamoud is graciously uh, volunteering uh, some of her time to mentor one, one of our viewers, female viewers. Yeah. So uh, if you're interested in doing that and sit down with uh, Fadwa Hamoud, uh, contact us at hiyamentor at gmail.com and we'll be back.
One, we are business consultants who equip leaders to lead at their highest level while building teams that work together and support their team and the leadership. We deliver customized business solutions that fit your company's needs, including business development and customized process solutions. Contact us today. Thank you. اهلا وسهلا فيكم مجددا ببرنامج هي وانا مع فدوى حمود محامي الاستئناف العام بولايه ميشيغان ومنكمل الحديث معها بالانجلش اوكي ويلكم باك سو ايد لايك تو توك اباوت يو نو از ا سوليسيتور جنرال يو هاندل موست سم اوف ذا موست كومبلكس كيسز ان ا نيشن ناو بيكوز ذا هول وورلد ناو نوز اباوت فلنت واتر كرايسيس ذات ستارتد ان 2014 اند And, uh, has caused death and uh, uh, you know permanent illnesses uh, for people of, of Flint and this case has dragged forever and it cost the state millions of dollars That's so right. uh, you you took on this case and uh, the charges were dropped so can you just update us on on this case so I told uh, I told Hanan off air that I, I have to be very careful when I talk about the investigation, <laughs> and that is to preserve the integrity of the work that we are doing. Right? Um, I currently lead the prosecution on the Flint water crisis. I do that with Prosecutor Kim Worthy, uh, and it has been uh, one of the biggest honors and. Uh, most difficult as well in my life. Difficult from a humanitarian point of sure. view, but also as an attorney and public service, uh, a pu public servant that saw the millions of dollars uh, that people benefited off of a crisis, right? And when we talk about the Flint water crisis, we are talking about um, uh, the, the worst man-made environmental catastrophe in our nation's history, Absolutely. In, in my opinion and in many others. And when we talk about, you know, the effects of what happened or it started in 2014, uh, you know, Flint was a marginalized community and, you know, uh, what Flint went through started way before 2014, mm -hmm. whether it was through their economy, infrastructure, education, kind of what we see like other marginalized communities around the state. Uh, I can tell you that uh, it is uh, a case that is every little bit worth fighting for. Um, and to me, um, this investigation and the, and the team that I have uh, on the Flint Water prosecution uh, are some of the most dedicated public servants that spend, in fact, they're working right now. Uh, that spend time around the clock mm -hmm. working on this case. So you uncovered uh, new documents, obviously. Th your team uh, uncovered uh, documents that previous investigators took many years <coughs> and they did not even discover, this is right? Th the way we look, yes. The way we look at this That's is... That's what you cited. Yes. Uh, the people of Flint deserve the same investigation um, as if there was lead poisoning in the White House or in Congress, whatever investigation those people get, then that's the investigation that we are going to give to the citizens of Flint. And that was the promise from day one. Our attorney general brought it back in-house. Mm -hmm. And, you know, no longer to a private firm that is benefiting or getting paid off of prosecution. Um, and it was prosecution for profit. So... What, when we talk about giving the citizens of Flint the investigation that they deserve, that is exactly what is happening right now. Though I cannot talk about the details, um, I can tell you that we are moving forward, and I am extremely proud of where we are at uh, right now. But you're um, starting, uh, are you starting new investigation now? or We continued the continued investigation, it. and to this point we have the most comprehensive body of evidence that this team has ever had. And the way we approached this case was uh, evidence is not up for negotiation. Mm. This is a crime that happened. We are executing search warrants. I executed a search warrant on my own office, which was unheard of. 
I sent officers to the attorney general's office to receive, you know, for, for what we knew to be evidence in this case. Did you face any objection at all? I mean, thankfully, uh, you know, I mean, it, it, it was not a move that many people take. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell you, um, people that know me know that uh, I will take every measure necessary, and not just me. Uh, I have a great team that my team will take every measure necessary to make sure that we seek justice for the citizens of Flint. Mm. And I think that the contrary, people respected that and they saw that for the first time, this case is being handled by law enforcement the way a prosecution is supposed to be handled. Okay. Um, and, you know, as a result of which, we went from less than two million documents to now uh, about 20 million documents. That's a lot of documents. It's a lot of documents. It's uh, like unheard of. <laughs> and it is, uh, you know, there was recently um, a conference, like a relativity conference for dis e discovery and its discovery paper and whatnot. And, and the criminal case prosecution is the largest in terms of documents and, and evidence and discovery in the nation that's on a platform right now. So it's a lot of work. Uh, but you're continuing. You're going to go uh, full forth, right? Oh, absolutely. Okay. And, you know, um, we will go where this investigation leads. Okay. Um, and though I can't talk about the details right now, I tell you that... Uh, there is hope. There uh, is justice. Oh, extremely. There's hope and justice. I, I, and I tell you that um, there is a fire for justice in, in every single one of us. And, um, and w without talking about what's happening... Um, Good things are happening. Have you ever felt like threatened, especially taking on this case at all? You know, um, or scared? It makes it uh, when when you look at the citizens of Flint and what they um, have been through, it makes it really hard to complain. Okay. You know about anything else? I mean, you have lead changes your DNA. Yeah. You have children for generations and generations and generations to come that are going to be affected by this crisis. Yes. Um, people are still scared to shower in Flint or drink the water. And we're not in the third world country. And we're not. Well, this uh, well is, you wouldn't you believe know. that we're not. Yeah. So have I received some pushback? Has it been hard? Yes. Is it, um, uh, do I feel like I even have the room to complain? I am doing just fine. Many people are doing just fine com when you look at uh, what people are going through, especially in communities like Flint. So working on this case, uh, I'm sure it has taken a toll on your personal life and your family. How do you manage? You know, it is, um, it's one, uh, I fight for the children of Flint more. Uh, you know, I've had many conversations with my husband and my children. In fact, um, a couple of days ago when I was in Flint, I got uh, a call from uh, Julia asking me if the kids there asked about her. Oh. Um, I would hope that if something were to happen to my own children, uh, my husband would hope that if something were to happen to, to our own children, oh my that God. there are people <laughs> fighting on their behalf. And uh, none of us are immune from disasters and catastrophes and injustices. And we must make sure that, uh, you know, when, when my kids grow up, uh, they'll know that their mother and their father, and they too as well in their help, uh, um, made sure that, that they were part of this fight, that we did not just stand by in silence. And it would, to me, would be a catastrophe if one day my children grew up and knew that my, you know, their father and I um, could change uh, or could fight for, you know, uh, children like Flint yes. and had the opportunity to and sat back in silence. That's not what I want my children to remember about me. And I'm sure, you know, my husband would luck. not wish yeah. you the best of luck on this case. It's Thank a huge you. case and yes. uh, it's crazy. <laughs> it is, it uh, it's mind boggling, yes. right? I mean, you mentioned a third world country and you often and wonder not, if this happened in a different zip code, 
uh, would we be in the situation that we are in right now? Uh, you know, forget just, it, when we talk about the health mm. crisis alone, the mistrust in government, you know, the psychological aspect of this is a, is a you know, tragedy sure. on its sure. own too. Yes. Uh, we're going to tackle a little bit about the opioid epidemic that's been, I mean, no community is immune to, to this uh, epidemic and it's uh, causing, uh, you know, people are dying, uh, thousands of people are dying in the United States. What are your thoughts as a solicitor general? I mean, it is, uh, it is an epidemic that I can tell you is sweeping the nation. And uh, we definitely have to make sure that we step up to the plate. And in order to do that, I've learned that with a, with a crisis such as the opioid crisis, it starts at home. And it starts with understanding that, um, you know, especially in communities like our own communities, to us, health is from the neck down always. Even though, you know, today, in today's world, I think that we quickly learn, and other communities have, have caught on to this quicker sure. than we have, that the most important part of our health is from the neck up. Mm -hmm. And it is so important, one, uh, when we talk about this at, at a smaller scale, is that every single one of us is accountable. And I, and, in terms of our community involvement to stop this, this crisis, this epidemic. And on a larger scale, we need to start holding those opiate companies accountable for, for, the, for this crisis that is happening across the nation. And that is something that we are doing at the Attorney General's office that, you know, I can't go into detail. You can't go into details about, about today. that? Uh, Not even a letter? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather not, <laughs> but you know, hopefully soon, um, you know, we, we can talk more about that. Yeah. But you know, we're in, in very sensitive stages uh, of our fight against uh, some, you know, major companies. Okay. But you know, I do. I think that uh, one. Uh, I don't think there's a, there's anyone that we talk to across the nation right now that doesn't recognize that this is a problem. It is a problem. That is, you know, it just I taking mean, our country. Uh, whether, you know, I mean, I tell you, we see it from our doctors to there, are, there is not one thing that you can pin it on, right? Mm -hmm. From over prescribing to companies putting substances, you know, that are extremely addictive uh, to lack of it's education. out of control, and basically. to depression because mental health is real. And, you know, being talking about this not in a shameful way but acknowledging that this is a sickness like people get sick mm. some people you know have a sickness and we have to understand that this is exactly how we need to treat this this we can no longer talk about this and shame people uh, we have to start figuring out solutions and not knocking people down and we have to start taking mental health seriously, seriously. Uh, to where you know, we change our communities to where they know where to turn to, you know, and hopefully it's a place other than a pill. But I can't say this enough. Health in our communities has to stop being considered as something from our neck down. And we have to make sure that we look at this as a crisis and that we no longer brush it under the rug and that we have the resources, you know, available. That's what we can do as a community. As a state, we, st we have to start holding those accountable who are over-prescribing, whether it is, you know, people in the medical community, or whether it's people out on the streets that are passing this out, whether it's in our schools, in our community centers, and it happens. How can, be how can it be controlled? I think that this is a combined joint effort with our law enforcement, but also with our families, that this is not, s and with our children, that it is so important, one, you know, uh, to speak up, right? But when, when, we, when we say how can it be controlled, I mean, there's one that is tangible where you're working with, with law enforcement. But another is something that you really can't put your finger on it other than we have to step up and start acknowledging that mental health is real. Yes. And people need help. And that seeking mental health help should not be something that is shameful. And that is still 
something that I say when we talk about the community as a we whole. We have to get rid of we the have to, we have shame to get better based at. Uh, stigma. We have to get rid of that. I think this is the most important thing, right? Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. So we're going to shift the uh, subject now All right. and talk <laughs> about, like, you inspire so many women uh, out there, and especially Arab American women. I want you to give uh, words of wisdom to those women who are watching us today. They, and you know, um, Arab American, when, if this message is specifically for them, um, uh, I tell every you know, young Arab American woman or Muslim woman uh, that they are the reason why I do what I do. Other than representing you know, our nation as a whole, uh, you know, I think that being a pioneer for women or, or representing women or opening up that door to make sure that this experience is not about the first, it's that uh, I am not the last. I depend on them uh, to keep moving forward. And that when we open doors, it's not just to bring more air in or, you know, to, to refresh. It's because I'm waiting for that army, uh, just like those before me has do have done for me, uh, of women. I think that, um, you know, I, I do understand, like, some of the questions that we received today. Mm. Um, that we still have a long way to go as women. Uh, but I am so proud to be a strong Arab American woman surrounded by many of them, those that I know. Mm -hmm. I haven't met one Arab American woman that, you know, hasn't inspired me in one way or another. And, you know, if they do look at me as a mentor, and I am honored by that, I want to remind them that there are generations coming, like my own very daughter, Julia, who's going to look for them to open up that door to, and after her and after her. So I consider myself to be one soldier in this, you know, big army for justice for women and whatnot. And I commend the men in our lives who have been our allies and who don't look at this as something that's out of the norm or, you know, not ordinary. And that, you know, this really has to uh, be an, an effort where we support each other as women and that we have, you know, uh, our allies support us as well. This is and, important. <laughs> and I cannot tell you the joy I get when I see women in our community uh, prosper. And I think the sky is the limit. And I think that my story is maybe going to be a footnote very soon. Uh, because I cannot wait to see what the future holds for Arab American women. We hope so. In our and, and I hope a lot of women are watching us tonight. It's a great advice from you. And I think America is ready for more w women leaders. Are they ready? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they better and watch out because we're coming whether they're <laughs> ready or not. <laughs> So yeah. we congratulate you oh, thank on you. this position. You are an amazing lady and such an ins inspiration. What are your aspirations from, from now? You know, when I became a Solicitor General, I never planned on becoming a Solicitor General, mm -hmm. right? My aspirations are to continue doing what I do best, and that is be the best me that I can be and wherever that takes me, I'm ready for it. And that's my aspiration. My, you know, it is to continue doing uh, what I do on a daily basis, carrying everything that was instilled in me uh, from my childhood. You know, continue doing what I do as a woman, as a mother, as a wife, as a daughter, and taking everything from that collective achievement. Mm -hmm. And wherever that takes me, you know, I'm really excited. I'm excited and I'm ready for it. And right now, I couldn't be in a better place, um, and, you know, representing the people of the state of Michigan, representing the citizens of Flint, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And, you know, if, if the future holds anything, I hope that I see that maybe my successes made it easier for somebody else to accomplish theirs. Yes. Or made it the norm that this is no longer the impossible, that it is just the norm. 
Yes. And, and that's what I hope for. And the sky is the limit, as you said. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you very much for this interview. We Thank you. We wish you the best of luck. Uh, Everything, for everything. <laughs> thank you, and thank you for thank the show, you. and thank, thank you for you. inspiring women everywhere. I mean, you know, this show in specific through WhatsApp media, I know you have some soldiers behind the scene as well, oh, and yeah. an <laughs> ally for women, yes. Hassan Hashim. Uh, you know, and, and the work that you do, uh, telling stories, uh, and you know, uh, spreading the work out through different the word out through different stories from from women from all over. Yes, yes. Uh, and each one has a story. <laughs> that I wish uh, when I was younger, I had seen more of that uh, to know that it was something that is within reach. And hopefully, through this show, you can send the message to women everywhere that, so. that that you know. That's uh, the idea. It is definitely within reach. So thank I commend you, so you for the work that thank you're you, doing. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate right. it. Thank, thank you. you. I appreciate and you that's having it for me. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, and have a good night. Thank good you. Good night.